Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted that you have decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're just on the early lessons in our study of the book of Job. This is lesson number two in that series for October 8th of 2016. And interestingly enough, even though we're talking about the book of Job, this lesson is entitled, The Great Controversy. Isn't that interesting? I hope you have your Bibles handy. Most of our information will be from the first two chapters of Job, so it shouldn't be too difficult to keep track of that. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we consider the challenges that have been made to your character and your government down through the generations, and especially the work of Satan, help us to understand in this lesson and the ones that will follow uh, exactly what the issues are so that we may stand on the right side, on your side, uh, right through whatever events may happen between now and the end of this earth is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Seventh-day Adventists who have carefully studied scriptures and the writings of Ellen White believe that it really is impossible to correctly understand many par portions of scripture unless you understand the great controversy. So the great controversy, some people have called it the cosmic conflict. What is the great controversy all about? You can summarize that in five words, can't you? <laughs> I should be able to. Well, which great controversy are you talking about? Well, that's a good question. That's I went on a tour of Europe sometime not too long back, and it was called the Great Controversy Tour. Oh, wow. And um, I think it's a different, it might have been a bit different great controversy than you're talking about. Yes. Milton talked about a controversy between good and evil. Is that what you're talking about? Well, ba and let me add to that, back in the days of Ellen White, People thought she borrowed from a gentleman who wrote a, a book entitled The Great Controversy Between God and Man. That was his idea what the Great Controversy was about. And many Christian Christians, scholars, etc., believe that whatever great controversy it, there is, it's kind of a, a battle between good and evil. And sure, that, all those things are partly true, but we would like to suggest, along with, of course, as, as guided by Ellen White, that the great controversy is really a battle in which the devil has accused God of many things. He has made accusations, he, have, he has made, he's told lies about God, he, was the, he is the father of lies, John 8. And the great controversy is really the record of how God has refuted and answered repeatedly and convincingly Satan's accusations in this war that we call the cosmic conflict of the great controversy. Wouldn't you also say that the devil never gives up on his end of it yeah. right until the third coming? Yep. Then he tries to incite the rebellious to take the mm -hmm. city, mm -hmm. even though he knows that he's doomed. For those of you who aren't too sure if the great controversy is in Scripture, uh, go to our website. Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Uh, you can go to the Teacher's Guide section and look for general topics. Or if you get our handouts, which are available on, this, uh, on that same website, Theox dot O-R-G, for this lesson, the, the um, IRL, is, URL is right there. You just click on it and it'll take you to a handout entitled The Great Controversy in Scripture. And you'll see that there's a lot of references to what we understand the Great Controversy is all about right there and carrying it right through from the beginning, from the rebellion, from the sins in the beginning, right through to the end. But now our lesson this time is looking at the Great Controversy in light of the story of Job. Uh, and once again, we don't believe that you can understand the Book of Job and the issues that were involved in the Book of Job unless you have some idea of the great controversy. Do you think that they were talking about the great controversy? Who, Job and his Job friends? Job and his friends? No, they were, they were participating in the great controversy, but they weren't talking about it. Okay. They were involved, they were making statements on the two sides, 
But I don't think they knew that they were really talking about the Great Controversy. Was Job talking about it at all? Yes. He was talking about it or just in it? Uh, you think well, he, you, uh, mean, you mean he wasn't referencing the Great Controversy. He was in it, and he was, he was making statements that are relevant to the Great Controversy. But if you're talking about, if your question is, was he, did he reference the Great Controversy per se? No. The chapters 1 and 2 and 42 talk about it a lot. Yes, yes. And how, where did those chapters come from? Well, that's one of the questions we have to, we have to struggle with. Um, Satan has done his very best to malign the character of God. When, when he cannot attack or, or malign God's character, he tries to do that to God's followers here on this earth. In our previous lesson, which we hope you heard last week, we suggested that there are interesting parallels between the story of Job and his experiences, the final days of really basically Passion Week for Jesus Christ, and the experiences of the 144,000 at the end of this world's history. Do you think you can see parallels from those in those three situations? I, I hope you'll be with us through the course of this quarter as we look at those issues. And I guess the question I should ask you, do you see evidence that, the Holy, that, the, that there's great controversy going on, that Satan's doing things in your own life and the lives of those around you? If you're talking the world scene, yes, very active. Mm -hmm. Well, there seems to be a clash, that's for sure, but it doesn't, it's not clear what's happening. Well, the devil doesn't want, from. yeah, the devil doesn't want it to be clear. He doesn't want it to be clear at all. I mean, you know, he doesn't want people to know that he's the one. Yeah, but behind. God wants it to be clear. Is what? he winning? Well, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's <laughs> really the question we have to deal with. Well, let's if you ask most people, the clash is between different views of society, not over the character of God. Yeah. Well, look at Job 1, 1 to 4, as we begin the story. There was a man named Job, living in the land of Uz, who worshipped God and was faithful to him. And I might add, nobody knows for sure where the land of Uz was. Job and probably most of his friends were rather probably... Um, moving people. They, they lived in a rel near desert area, probably somewhere out east of the Jordan River. And um, so, you know, they, 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 they didn't live in cities, as far as we can tell, although there seemed to be quite a few people around them at times. Um, anyway, going on, he was a good man and careful not to do anything evil. He had seven sons and three daughters and owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 1,000 head of cattle, and 500 donkeys. He also had a large number of servants and was the richest man in the East. And I was about to ask you how many people would it take care of, would it take to take care of all those animals? A lot, and you'd have to keep them moving because you'd have to be constantly looking for f food for these animals. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of animals to feed. And they didn't have barbed wire fences to keep them in. They did not, yeah. But going on, Job's sons used to take it in turns to give a feast to which all the others would come, and they always invited their three sisters to join them. So at this point in time, we don't know for sure what their ages were, but at least there wasn't rampant sibling rivalry, okay? So doesn't that sound like almost a perfect picture for someone in his society, his age, his time? Yeah, I think so. This idyllic picture suggests things are going very well for Job. And the real question we need to struggle with as we go through the book of Job, I hope you're writing down these questions to think about them as we move along. We're going to find that Job had quite an incredible relationship with God. How did he develop that relationship? I want you to remember there was no Bible in Job's day. There were no pastors. There were no churches, and for that matter, no synagogues. There were no prophets, as far as we know, at least none that we, have, we know by name. Where did he get his information? Where, how did he get to know God? How did Abraham get to know God? Well, we, we know that God visited Abraham fairly frequently, and I suspect that must be the story of Job as well. 
uh, I'm going to bring in a piece of Job that isn't suggested in our Bible study guide, but I think we need to mention it here. It's the first five verses of Job 29. Now, after, this is at the end of the discussions between the, the different groups, back and forth between Job and his enemies. And Job says this in his conclusion, If only my life could once again be as it was when God watched over me. God was always with me. What do you think that means? Then and gave, with me then, and gave me light as I walked through the darkness. Those were the days when I was pr prosperous, and the friendship of God protected my home. What, what's the friendship of God? Almighty God was with me then, and I was surrounded by all my children. So I think we need to remember that that's what Job came out of, right? So what was he saying there? Uh, well, can't let me ask you, what do you today, think? Huh? Couldn't anybody today say that very same thing with those same words? Well, if, if it's true, uh, I, I hope you wouldn't say that if you were lying. No, I mean, I, mean, I don't see any, any he, physical appearance of God where they talk and eat dinner together, th things like that. Like Abraham kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I don't see any of that there. I mean, there could be. You could interpret it that way, yeah. but, but... Well, he says, God was anybody, always with me. Yeah. He says, our friendship protected my home. That... That doesn't sound like a distant God to me. Well, it's not distant, but don't you think that anybody that's close to God could say that even today? If they're close to God, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, but, but I'm trying to see what your point is in saying that. I if think it's, the Holy Spirit must have been with him often. And in those societies, it seems God was almost more in tune to visiting with them, like Christ when he came and the two angels when they were looking at Sodom and Gomorrah and this kind of thing. Visiting Abraham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, somehow, this is what we know, somehow in those ancient times, Job managed to de develop a, and it depends on which translation you're using, blameless and upright or righteous character. In our world of sin, such a thing does not seem to happen by accident. You notice that? But that's not the end of the story. That's just barely the beginning of the story because look what happens in the next couple of verses. The morning after each, of each feast, Job would get up early and offer sacrifices for each of his children in order to purify them. He always did this because he thought that one of them might have sinned by insulting God unintentionally. What, what does that say to you? He's offering sacrifices because his children might have sinned. By insulting God? Does God get insulted? Well, it sounds like he was worried that they, they, they said something careless about God or something inappropriate about God. It seems like he was deeply involved with his family. I don't yeah. see anything here so far that indicates that he might have been the head man, but he wasn't up on a pedestal. He was involved yeah. in the whole family. Yeah. It well, almost sounds legalistic there for a little bit. And that's probably the only part of Job that does, mm -hmm. on Job's part anyway. But, you know, I have to do this or God's yeah. going God's gonna to zap my children is almost how it sounds. Yeah. Well, then all of a sudden the story changes. Where does this next part take place? When the day came for the heavenly beings, my version says, the original language is when the sons of God came to appear before the Lord, Satan was there among them. The Lord asked him, what have you been doing? Satan answered, I have been walking here and there, roaming around the earth. Okay. You know, to me, when I read that, it was kind of like a little bit of a, and, you know, I was walking around. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like walking around a bombed out place after there's been a war. Yeah. You know, you're just, you're just walking around and what okay. happened here? Let, let's think about what we know about the devil and what we know about God already. We don't have to guess about this. You can be sure if there's a blameless and upright person living on planet Earth, 
Satan has already done everything he possibly could to get at this guy, right? Unless God's do we, protecting him. Do we? Have, well, okay. Yeah, he, he put a put a hedge around him, but and he must have. <laughs> it stands to reason that de there had to be other humanity around beside Job. Mm -hmm. and you know, the devil was working amongst everywhere he could get an in. Yeah. Well, obviously, we're going to find out that he's in great communication with Job's closest friends. So, I mean, what does that tell you? Mm -hmm. He's busy. Yes. Well, Job apparently realized that it would be easy for one of his children to be drawn into the evil practices of those around them. He wasn't taking any chances. And here's a comment from uh, Ellen White's uh, it, it's mostly easy, most easily found in the in the STA Bible Commentary. That would be Volume Three, Page Eleven Forty, Paragraph Four. Amid the festivities of his sons and daughters, he trembled lest his children should displease God. As a faithful priest of the household, he offered sacrifices for them individually. He knew the offensive character of sin and the thought that his children might forget the divine claims led him to God as an intercessor in their behalf. Wow. That's, that hits me several different ways. I okay. don't know how to... Well, this offending God... Do you it, doesn't offend? Say, it doesn't say that he was offending God. It was that Job was afraid he was offending God. Afraid his children which were offending is, God. Why I, you know, why I said it's almost a legalistic view. Yeah. yeah. Well, so let's let's look at the next step here now. What did what did Satan say? I guess we should go back and 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 read the next verses. Did you? God said, verse eight. Did you notice my servant Job? The Lord asked. There is no one on earth as faithful and good as he is. He worships me and is careful not to do anything evil. And the original language suggests that this guy is basically perfect. Now, we don't mean perfect as in sinless. We know Job, like other human beings, is a sinner. But he was pretty good, pretty good relationship to God. Satan replies, would Job worship you if he got nothing out of it? You've always protected him and his family and everything he owns. You bless everything he does and you have given him enough cattle to fill the whole country. But now suppose you take away everything he has, he will curse you to your face. All right, the Lord said to Satan, everything he has is in your power, but you must not hurt Job himself. So Satan left. Now, my next question is this. Is this the first conflict over Job between, that happened between God and Satan? First conflict? Yeah. First oh. discussion. The first argument. I think. I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to think about how temptations happen, and and did God protect Job in some way? And if so, how did He do that? We we don't know. It doesn't give us a timeline of how long Job had been like this. But mm -hmm. it, I think you can pretty well f say that the devil had been at Job more than this occasion. Yeah. He had to have been. Yeah. Sure. But uh, the devil knew that he was being protected because if he wasn't, he would have done what he's going to do a long time ago. Well, I'm sure, again, let me, let me you know, speculate. This is hypoth hypothetical, but based on what I read in the rest of the Bible and no, repeated we're told that Job is the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of the Satan sisters. Satan is the accuser. Huh? Satan is the accuser. I'm sorry. Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters, my version says. He, I'm sure he's had arguments with God about the case of Job. Now, in fact, I'm sure when Satan came to heaven, he would like to have said to all the other sons of God, okay, you guys out there think you're all special, but I have my own earth, and there's no, everybody down there belongs to me. And I suspect he said something sort of like that. But he knew, and God knew, that was not true. Okay, listening to this, I, I've had similar thoughts that Gordon was expressing about uh, Job's verbalizing about God. 
uh, or protecting his children. But if you look at it bigger in that Job was doing what God was doing with Job. Job was encouraging his children to keep all of the ways of God and protected them in a certain way and gave the offerings just in case he had forgotten to tell them something or that evil had come in by way of neighbors or whatever. And how else is God going to teach his children? Yeah. Well, I mean, let me just ask you this question. I, I hope none of us believe here or think that God had put such a wall around Job and his children and his family that none of them could be tempted by the devil. That would remove their, remove their freedom, right? So we know that the devil had tried. I don't know. That would remove their freedom? Yeah. Just if there was a wall around? Well, yeah, but the wall doesn't restrict anybody. The wall just keeps the devil out. Okay, but I'm sure the devil would have claimed, and, and as he sort of does here, that God had protected them so much that he really couldn't get to them. When we were studying this book a number of years ago, not, not in this setting, but uh, with a, another group, it was said, Job probably thought, God, why did you bring me up? Why didn't you just leave things the way they were? Mm -hmm. You know, we had a good thing going. Why did he get, let the devil come in and well, do things? Well, that's what I was suggesting a moment ago. I'm sure that Job was trying to hint to the sons of, of God, to the, the whole crowd that was there, however many there are. I'm sure he was trying to hint, well, everybody on planet Earth belongs to me. Satan was, uh, Satan Satan. was say, saying that. You said Job again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Satan, man, that's bad news, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Satan was saying, this whole planet belongs to me. And God had to speak up at that point in time and say, have you considered my servant Job? I, I think that's why that, we, 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 we enter somewhere, I think we get into the conversation in the middle of the conversation. Well, if, if he believed that the earth belonged to him, what is the deed that states that? Well, his, his, his explanation would be, and why he was there, his explanation was Adam, sold his birthright to me when he committed sin at the, in the Garden of Eden. He, I am now the king. And even Jesus acknowledges in the New Testament, he calls him the prince of this earth. So God acknowledges it that pretty much this, this earth that does belong to Satan. Prince of this world. Hmm? The prince of this world. Yeah, the prince of it? this world, yeah. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a world. Yeah. But uh, what was I going to say here? As far as it, I was thinking that he was thinking that if God took all his blessings away from anybody, that's even the angels in the world, mm -hmm. that they would all curse him. Well, and in, this was the last. This was the last guy on earth that wasn't cursing him, or looked like it wasn't going to happen, and Satan. so that was the test yeah. right there. And if he would have fallen. Well, then that would have suggested that it would have happened to everybody else in the universe if, yep. if God took everything away. Yep. And they would all curse him. That's what Satan wanted to believe. Well, that's what he was trying to push out. Exactly. Well, many of our Christian friends believe that God is so sovereign, he's so high up there above us, that nothing that we do here on this earth can impact him any way. Does that seem to be true in the story of Job? It doesn't impact God. Doesn't impact God. Some of his Job's friends suggested that. Yeah. Yeah. You mean all that, of Job's friends? Yeah. yeah. Well, you mean that if he would sin, well, then God would turn on him? Is no. What I mean by that is God is up there. He's just sort of deciding. I mean, especially the people who believe that everything's already decided in advance. That that our our futures is already decided. Everything's, and we're all just a bunch of robots here doing what God has already decided. We're just a bunch of ants down here. Have no effect on him. That's Yeah. I, I think this brings out another part in the great <coughs> pardon me, controversy that there are a lot of folk out there that don't understand. The other worlds would have been looking on at what was going on here. 
mm -hmm. the same time. Yeah. Okay, so having said all that, let's see if we can move on in the story. Do you think Satan still attends the councils in heaven? Wasn't he prevented from doing that? When? It seems like somewhere I heard that. Way. I, I think know. at the cross. Yes, at the cross. yes, yeah. At the cross. But that was not true in the days of Job. No, no. Because who recaptured his dom dominion over this earth at the cross? Jesus did. Jesus did, yeah. Well, what about, do the sons of God, how, do they, how did the sons of God in the days of Job feel about Satan mocking God? Who were these sons of God? Do we know who they were? Other beings on other worlds. Where did you get that idea? Job 1 and 2. We told that? Well, yes. that's a clue. There's some other places. Look at Job 38, 7. Now, here's where God, at the end of Job, talks about how he created everything and so forth. And he says, In the dawn of that day, the stars sang together, and the heavenly beings, and that's the sons of God, shouted for joy. So, at the beginning of creation, he's saying, the heavenly beings, the sons of God, shouted for joy. That means it can't be anyone from... A lot of, a lot of our Christian friends believe that Christians who have died and gone to heaven are the sons of God. That can't possibly be true because these people were there before our world was created. Very important point. Um, what about Luke 3.38? I think this is maybe one of the convincing arguments for me. I've already suggested that Adam sold his, his kingship of this earth to Satan when he sinned. Notice, remember the, the genealogy of Jesus in Luke 3? It goes on, you know, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son is going back and back and back and back. And it says, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So, who, who was the son of God? One of the sons of God? Adam. It should have been Adam, should have, the, should have been the one there in that heavenly council. So, I don't understand. It said, it said Adam, then the son of God. Adam is the son of God. I know, but let's look at that list again. Okay. That you had. Well, I mean, I, I, if we had a long time, I'd read the whole list. It says but Adam. It just goes no, on. it says Adam, the son of God. Okay, I see. I see. Okay. So each one is mentioned, then he's the son of the previous one, and the son of the previous one, and the son of the previous one, okay? Are you sure that he's, he's prefacing Adam there, or if he's prefacing the real son of God? No, no, he's That's prefacing, Adam. it has to be Adam. Why? Well, because look at all the others, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son, each one is the son of the previous one. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's logical anyway. I believe it. Mm -hmm. Well, are there other times in the Bible where there's a big to-do, a big worry in heaven? I mean, heaven is supposed to be a perfect place with peace and so forth all the time, right? There was a big uprising in Revelation 5. A big uprising in Revelation 5. Why was that? You remember? Who can open the scroll? Yeah, there was a big... They were really worried that there wasn't anybody who could basically understand the great controversy, give the answers to the issues in the great controversy, as suggested by up opening the scroll and unsealing it. Of course, Jesus was, the Lamb of God was the one who was found who could do that. Didn't every, by that time, doesn't everyone, don't all the angels understand the great controversy well enough to, don't, if, if you won't. Read, if you read the end of the chapter on It Is Finished in Desire of Ages, it says, even after the death of, and the resurrection of Jesus, they still didn't completely understand. Well, not completely, but I mean, that's what we're going to be studying for the rest of eternity. But, uh, you know, there has to be a time when you have a good enough mm -hmm. idea that you can say, this is the way it is. Yeah. I'm going to refine it some more. Yeah. You know, I understand a bit about neurology, but I don't understand everything. Yeah. But I understand more than my wife. Let's <laughs> yeah, more than about me. neurology. <laughs> and I have I have, I have a doctorate. Well, when when you talked about nobody opening the scroll, how does that designate? Well, we rebellion? don't have a chance to discuss Rome, yeah, Revelation five today. It's a, but it's 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 in the context. 
they, the heavenly council right there around the throne of God was, was very, <coughs> very concerned because no one could be found who was able to <coughs> open the scroll. And if you look elsewhere and you explore that more, you find out that opening the scroll opens up the history of human, the human, human race and what happened to them and so forth. So, and the person who can answer the issues in the great controversy and the issue, answer the, the issues about the human race turns out to be the Lamb of God, Jesus. But let, let's not go there, okay, that, that's enough. Well, you made a claim there and, yeah. and I was a little bit confused. Okay. Well, why does God call councils in the, of the sons of God in heaven? I mean, he doesn't need any help figuring things out, does he? God? Yeah. No, but how about those around him? Let yeah. me ask you a question. Your brother happens to be president of the university. He has something called the counselors. Yes. Does he go to them for advice or something else? <laughs> And the answer probably is yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> he goes for a little bit of advice and a lot of funds. Yes, yes, yeah. But I think it shows now God could, if he wanted, he could say, I'm running this place. Mm -hmm. you, run, you, you run your business on your planet. And do it this way. If, I need, you, if I need you, I'll call you. Yeah. Well, you got to think what a counselor does, though. I mean, it, a, a leader decides to do something and the counselor will talk about, you know, all the ramifications. <clears throat> if God's the leader and he's always doing everything right, that means all his counselors are going to, going to be showing good, good okay. connotations all the time. Okay. We're going to suggest, largely based on the writings of Ellen White, but also based on hints of the Bible, that these sons of God are leaders of other societies, what do you want to call it, other planets in other parts of the world with beings of whatever kind we don't know out there that came, they come together from time to time and meet with God. We usually say in heaven, we don't know for sure where that is. Uh, so throughout the universe is what Throughout the universe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. have, to yeah. be. have to be a lot of people. And, yeah, and Satan makes his claim to be among them because he says he's the prince of this world. Um, well, we know, and we don't have time to read it now, there are lots of references to the conflicts that w that's gone on and so forth. Genesis 3, 1 to 4 talks about the fall. Zechariah 3 talks about how Satan came to accuse, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, who was that? what was the priest's name? Got a blank all of a sudden. Um, the angel of the Lord said, Joshua, yeah. May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves you, and Joshua is standing there, and so forth, yeah. Um, so, and all the way through, Matthew 4, 1, 1 Peter 5, 8, 1 John 3, 8, Revelation 12, 17, 7 to 12, it's possible to understand these verses without, is it possible to understand these verses without uh, believing that there's a personal devil because a lot of our Christian friends, a lot of our Christian friends, even Christian friends, don't believe the devil even exists. And even the ones who believe he exists, many of them think it's some kind of a m evil force or something like that. The idea that the devil could be a in live, intelligent being that's doing all this stuff is beyond them. Is that what you mean by personal devil? Yeah. Uh, the opening scenes of the book of Job, this is, uh, I'm reading from our adult Bible, our Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. The opening scenes of the book of Job show us a few crucial points. First, as we have stated, they reveal the reality of another dimension beyond what of ourselves we can now know, a heavenly dimension with heavenly beings other than God. So we, have, we would have no way of knowing about anything about that at all except that we're told by the Bible. Second, they also show just how interconnected our earthly life here is with the heavenly realm. What happens here on the earth is not disconnected from the heavenly beings in this realm. And third, they reveal a moral conflict in heaven that is indeed connected to what has happened and what is happening here on planet earth. Well, these verses don't tell us how this conflict got started. And if we had a lot of time we would go back and we would read Isaiah 14, especially verses 12 to 14, and Ezekiel 28, especially verses 
12 to 16 and 1 Timothy 3, 6. And what would we learn there? Satan was once a covering cherub, stood next to the throne of God and wanted, him, wanted himself to be regarded as equal with Jesus Christ. And he started to, he became jealous, he became greedy, he became envious, and he managed to trick a third of the angels into believing like he did, that somehow or other that if God would just be more fair to the angels, they could have higher positions, better positions. So he tricked sinless angels who were in the very presence of God, so it had to be a very subtle argument that he gave. Mm -hmm. Well, but now, if we suggest that Jesus answered most of those questions and accusations in the great controversy, why are we still here 2,000 years later? Because. Why? Because. That's not a long answer. <laughs> we haven't been pulling our weight. We haven't been pulling our weight. Why can't God just wrap things up? Well, here's, here's what Ellen White says in a very revealing passage. This actually is found in um, Desire of Ages, page 22, paragraph 1. The earth was dark. Now, this was just before the coming of Christ, but it gives us a general picture. The earth was dark to a misapprehension of God. In other words, that Satan had been very successful at, at misrepresenting God that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. So why can't he just wrap things up? He refuses to abuse or take away our freedom. That's the principle of his government. Yeah. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It can only be won, it cannot be won by force or authority, only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. This work only one being in the, all the universe could do. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the Son of Righteousness must rise with healing in his wings, Malachi 4.2. And then we read about Satan. There was one who perverted the freedom that God had granted to his creatures. Sin originated with him who, next to Christ, had been most honored of God and was the highest in power and glory among the inhabitants of heaven. Great Controversy 493, paragraph 3. As we have stated repeatedly in the past, God's government is based on love. No force is exercised, ever. God will accept only voluntary service. So does that have something to do why God, with why God can't save sinners? What would happen if God took a bunch of sinners to heaven? If they w weren't changed or weren't uh, willing to learn, sin would start again. All over again, the great controversy all over again. So he doesn't block the freedom when he doesn't bring them into heaven. Well, he just, he just says, I am terrible. I love all you guys. I, he loves everybody, from Lucifer down, okay? But he says, I'm sorry, when I get ready to set up my eternal kingdom again, you can't I, come I, I cannot admit someone who's going to just start this mess all over again. So they're not, they're so, not welcome. They're not welcome, but they're also not free to come in. No. Well, they, there's so no then they're they can, not free. They're not, there's no way they could come in unless God brought them in. So unless, he doesn't bring them. Unless there's something else happening besides bringing them in. Mm, okay. God feels once is enough. Yeah. Unfortunately, most of us as human beings have little understanding of the great controversy. We still see through a glass darkly, as Paul said, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. To get, to get a much better idea of how sin began, and I would like to challenge you, especially those of you who are Seventh-day Adventists, to read Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 33 to 43, and then again, The Great Controversy, page 492 to 504, and you'll get a very good idea about how sin got started. A careful reading of the Scriptures will reveal that Satan prefers to keep himself hidden behind the scenes as much as possible. Is that why many Christians don't think there is a personal devil? 
Absolutely. He uses people and he uses organizations down through the generations to do his dirty work. Even in the book of Job, it might appear superficially that Satan's only appearances are in Job 1, 6 to 12, and 2, 1 to 7. That is not true. I know that our Bible study guides seem to suggest that. I would say it's not true. Read Job 4, 12 to 21, where we see Eliphaz, one of Job's so-called friends, repeating a message he got directly from Satan himself, or possibly from one of Satan's evil angels. So, is Satan present if someone's repeating his message to Job? Indirectly, I, yes. I call that Satan's activity right in the middle of things. And that message, by the way, is repeated. It's repeated in Job 9, verse 2. It's repeated in Job 25, verse 4. They came, his, Job's friends came back to it again and again, repeating Satan's accusations against God and against Job. That was that um, God even finds the, bad the, the, the good angels. The argument is no human being can be good. You don't even pretend, Job, that you're a good man because no human being can be good. God, does, God he, he could just crush all of us. We don't mean anything to him. We're just no, no better than a moth or an old pot. So they were saying Job was getting it because Job thought he was good. Yeah, partly. And that's what Job said. I, I didn't do the sins you're accusing me of. Well, in the New Testament, we find that, Jesus, that, that Satan came and tempted, tempted Jesus. And what did Jesus finally say to him? Get behind me. Get, behind. Get out of here. Um, the book of Job doesn't ultimately explain how Satan is finally defeated. Do we know how Satan is finally defeated? Well, it didn't work out like Satan said it was going to. So, so one thing, if um, your forte is telling lies, how do you get defeated? Someone revealing the truth, right? Well, the truth, what is that? It's just that Satan said if you do all this stuff, if the, all this stuff happens to, to Job, he's going to curse you in, his, you in your face. And it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So something didn't happen. That's why he well, was defeated. Okay, but that's my point. The truth was revealed. Something didn't happen the way he said it was going to happen. That Job wasn't going to. It's funny that... Um, the devil was proved wrong in one time out of billions. Yeah, well, but... But he, that's enough. Yes, exa well, not just that. Job has been... Re he, Job was, de I'm sorry, Satan was defeated in the case of Job. He was defeated in the case of Christ. He will be defeated in the case of the 144,000 at the end. Those are, those are critical battles, and every one of the critical battles he loses. Now, he, lo he wins a lot of other cases in between, I know. But here's one of the reasons why we, we I think, can absolutely <coughs> say we know what's, what the battle is about. Look at Romans 3, 25 and 26. This is one of the few places in Scripture where one of the Bible writers intentionally tries to explain why Jesus had to die and how that impacts us. My Good News Bible says this, God offered him, that is Jesus, so that by his blood or by his sacrificial offering of himself, he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. Okay, so how does that happen? God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. In the past, he was patient and overlooked people's sins, but in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. And this way, God shows that he himself is righteous and that, oh yes, by the way, he puts, everyone who believe, he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. Now, Almost everybody in the Christian community who talks about why Jesus had to die, it's all about what God does for us. This verse says three times that it was about God's righteousness before it mentions what he does for us. I, I think that's really significant. And his righteousness was being shown by him doing those things? Yes. Throughout the ages, many cultures have myths or ancient stories about conflicts between good and evil. 
modern higher criticism has even led many Christians to deny the, the reality of a personal devil and his angels. Fortunately, there are some among our Christian friends who recognize the reality of the cosmic conflict. We're not the only ones. Gregory Boyd has written a book entitled God at War. Does that sound like an interesting book? Where he commented on Daniel 10 by saying, the Bible from beginning to end presupposes spiritual beings who exist, quote, between humanity and God, and whose behavior significantly affects human existence for better or for worse. Indeed, just such a conception, I argue in this work, lies at the center of the biblical world view. So he thinks you need to understand the presence of these other beings and how they're involved in order to understand the Bible. So what would happen to our understanding of the great controversy if Satan doesn't exist? Well, for one thing, evil would be natural in us. It's pretty natural already, but... No, well, I mean natural with everybody, because if there was no Satan... Yeah. Well, um, basically, the, the man who wrote the book back in the days of Ellen White would be right. The, the conflict would, between, would be between God and us. Is that what Milton thought in Paradise Lost? Yeah. Let me not judge Milton right now. I, I'm not sure that I'm... Well, a lot of people, when you start talking about this thing, they go back to Milton. And they mm -hmm. said, oh, that's just influenced by Milton. And you've got to be able to answer that. Yeah. And there might be some influence there. I, who knows? Maybe Milton got some things right, but... Yeah. Not the whole I, picture. I wouldn't, I wouldn't picture, say that, right. yeah, I wouldn't say that he left the devil completely out of the picture. Even when it was decided, now again, I'm going to quote from Ellen White, even when it was decided that he could no longer remain in heaven, infinite wisdom did not destroy Satan. Why not? Why not just get rid of him back in the beginning? He's a rebel, get rid of him. I don't Sin think that takes infinite wisdom. I mean, right now, there's lots of humans that get rid of people they don't like. Yeah. Well, but, <laughs> And you but know what happens. Everybody gets is, scared of them. The infinite wisdom did not get rid of him. That was the infinite wisdom. Did not get, yeah. But. Since, the, since the service of love can alone be acceptable to God, the allegiance of his creatures must rest upon a conviction of his justice and benevolence. The inhabitants of heaven, and of other worlds being unprepared to comprehend the nature or consequences of sin could not then have seen the justice and mercy of God in the destruction of Satan. I mean, I saw someone represent it like this. Suppose that all of a sudden uh, an accusation came up from somewhere saying the president has done something terribly wrong. President of the United States has done something terribly wrong. And the people, and so invest it, of course you can imagine how an investigation will come about. And then it turns out that maybe two or three members of his cabinet who really are on the inside of things are involved in making this accusation. And then suppose that a week or two later, those people just disappear. That's how it happens, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, what does that make you think? They were onto something. They were onto something. That's exactly what would have happened if God had just eliminated Satan. Mm -hmm. Well, um, had he been immediately blotted out, that would be from existence, Satan, they would have served God from fear rather than from love. The influence of the deceiver would not have been fully destroyed, nor would the spirit of rebellion have been utterly eradicated. Evil must be permitted to come to maturity. Through ceaseless ages, Satan must more fully develop his principles that his charges against the divine government might be seen in their true light by all created beings, that the justice and mercy of God and the immutability of his law might forever be placed beyond all question. Desi uh, Great Controversy 498, 499. So, one more place. At the beginning of the Great Controversy, the angels did not understand this. Had Satan and his host then been left to reap the full result of their sin, they would have perished, but it would not have been apparent to heavenly beings that this was the inevitable result of sin. 
a doubt of God's goodness would have remained in their minds as evil seed to produce its deadly fruit of sin and woe. But not so when the great controversy shall be ended. Then the place plan of redemption having been completed, the character of God is revealed to all created intelligences. The precepts of his law are seen to be perfect and immutable. Then sin is made manifest, its nature, Satan his character. Then the extermination of sin will vindicate God's love and establish his honor before a universe of beings who delight, delight to do his will and in whose heart is his law. Well then might the angels rejoice as they looked upon the Savior's cross. For though they did not then understand all, see Gordon your question earlier, though they did not then understand all, they knew that the destruction of sin and Satan was forever made certain, that the redemption of man was assured and that the universe was made eternally secure. Christ himself fully comprehended the results of the sacrifice made upon Calvary. To all these he looked forward when upon the cross he cried out, It is finished. Desire of Ages 764. So why is it that God is so opposed to having us serve him out of fear? This is a quotation that very few people know about, and I'm going to read it to you. It was first found in Signs of the Times, July 22, 1897, and not repeated every, anywhere in, its, in, in, as much as, in as much detail as I'm going to read it to you right now. A sullen submission to the will of the Father. That means you do it because, and he's talking about the Father, he's talking about God. You do it because you think you have to. Will develop the character of a rebel. <coughs> By such a one, service is looked upon as drudgery. It is not re rendered cheerfully and in the love of God. It is a mere mechanical performance. If he dared, so uh, Gary, this is your question. Why couldn't God take sinners to heaven? If he dared, in the freedom of heaven, such a one would disobey. His rebellion is smothered now, ready to break out at any time in bitter murmurings and complaints. <coughs> such service brings no peace or quietude to the soul. <coughs> Excuse me. Is it obvious to you that we are still in the great controversy? Definitely. Will Satan be able to ultimately destroy us? We don't no. We don't have time to read it now, but Isaiah 33, verses 10 through 16 say, we will be preserved by God in the midst of the fire. So, why isn't, why isn't God, Satan doing to us now what he did to Job? Is it because God has a fence around us? Or are we already on Satan's side? Or are we at least not enough on God's side so we're no threat to Satan's kingdom? This is what, in talking about the delay, this is what it says in 2 Peter 10, verses, an expansion of 2 Peter 10, I'm sorry, 3 verses 10 to 12. Um, and this is from Helen White, first of all from Desire of Ages 633. By giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power to hasten our Lord's return. And then Testimonies, Volume 8, pages 22 and 23, and that's repeated in Evangelism, page 696, 695, paragraph 5. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Were all who profess His name, bearing fruit to His glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel, Quickly the last harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. So when Satan accused Job, did he really care about Job? No. No. Or was his plan to accuse Job, Job in order to accuse God? Satan was hoping to prove that God was mistaken when he said that Job was blameless and upright. Clearly, Job suffered a lot through this book. Is that, by causing suffering, the only way that Satan gets involved in the events of this earth? It might be easy for those of us growing up with Western mindsets to think that in the great controversy, there are two equally powerful forces in conflict. That is not true. Satan's very life is sustained by God. No life can exist without God's continuing support and power. God could have, and now I quote again from Desire of Ages 7, 759, 
God could, could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can cast a pebble to the earth. He, but he did not do this. Rebellion is not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only in sa under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His authority rests upon goodness, mercy, and love, and the presentation of these principles is the means he used to be used. God's government is moral, and truth and love are to be the prevailing power. It may be hard for us to understand why God did not just eliminate Satan when he first started to rebel or perhaps quarantine him. I mean, why not just, if you don't want to eliminate Satan, why not just send him, okay, you can have your own world in the far corners of the universe somewhere where he can't get, <laughs> can't get close to anybody else. Just quarantine him over there. Put him in isolation. Put him in isolation. <laughs> but God was not happy with the idea of just eliminating Satan. He wants to make it decisively clear why Satan must be defeated and disprove all his arguments. One of the ways in which Satan has tri triumphed... So we needed to, the, the ra human race and all of the universe had to be immunized against sin. Yes. Had to understand what it, yes. what it was. Our lesson goes on to describe, and I don't have time to review that right now, there, there are many stories in ancient times about how evil and, and, and good are in conflict and so on forth. One of the most famous ones is a, is a story of uh, Enuma Elish story in, from ancient Babylon, but there are many, many others. Uh, and they're just barbaric stories, basically. Gods tearing each other apart and throwing pieces here and there and crazy stuff. Well, unfortunately, we must admit that Satan has often been pictured in Christian art with horns and animal parts along with a tail and all that kind of stuff. One who stokes the fires of hell with a pitchfork. That's not the kind of Satan we believe in. There are false pictures that are so unbelievable. Many moderns have just completely rejected the idea of a devil as we've already suggested. And I would like to read in our conclusion, it is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. Yet enough may be understood concerning both the origin and the final disposition of sin to make fully manifest the justice and benevolence of God in his, all his dealings with evil. Nothing is more plainly taught in Scripture than that God was in no wise responsible for the entrance of sin. And we must conclude there. Go for it. Our kind and wonderful Father, we know how significant these issues are and how key they are to understanding so much of Scripture and for us to understand how we can defeat this Satan with your help and with your blessing. Give us and those who listen to our program a new understanding, a better understanding of what the great controversy is all about is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.